from section four of chapter 16, the majority of the work is actually about deriving the wave equation on a string. Now, I'm not going to worry about that derivation. And actually, we don't need to worry about this specific equation in itself. But I want to talk a little bit about the idea of generalizing this, because this is something that's going to be relevant later when we talk about electromagnetic waves in detail. So note that capital D here is our displacement. So that is the disturbance in the medium if we're talking about a mechanical wave. Now, in the case of a string, this was derived from just looking at Newton's laws, effectively F equals MA, where we remember that this is F net and that A is also a vector. However, there's a problem that if we're talking about a string, it's actually continuous. We don't just have a single object. So that's why we actually end up with this fairly complicated equation. So remembering here that d is actually going to be a function of position and time. So you start from Newton's laws, you think about a tiny piece of the string, and you think about how one piece of the string impacts the next p tiny piece of the string, and how that then changes what's happening in space and time. We're then left with this kind of complicating, complicated looking equation. Note that the funny looking d is a partial derivative. So that means that you're taking your function, in this case displacement d, and taking derivative with respect to one of its values, right? It depends on two different uh, variables. So that's what the funny looking d is, a partial derivative. So notice that this is a wave on a string, and so that string part is really controlling this. T was the tension in the string, mu is the mass per length. So we get this relationship that we haven't actually assumed that we have a wave per se. We're just really asking what happens if you have equilibrium and then we have something happening where it's off equilibrium. And you know, maybe it looks all goofy. But we can zoom in and we can ask how this displacement function, which would be the green one from equilibrium, relates to position and time. So again, don't worry too much about the derivation of this, but let's actually think about what's going on with this. This is a differential equation. This is defining what the motion will look like, and so this is solving the differential equation is then finding the functional form that the motion will have. Now, in our wave equation, that's going to be our displacement, which depends on both position and time. The previous time, in intro physics we've seen differential equations is simple harmonic motion so in this case u was some sort of um, coordinate for instance maybe x and then we had that our second derivative of that coordinate with respect to time was negative times some constant times the coordinate itself and we saw that a mass on a spring obeyed this and that a pendulum obeys it as long as we use the small angle approximation. And you've possibly seen other oscillatory behaviors that also follow this form. So the reason I'm pointing this out is that any time you have physics that leads to an equation that looks like this, that was actually coming from Newton's laws, you know you are going to get simple harmonic motion. This is then what happens. So similarly, whenever you have something kind of of this form, that means you're going to get waves. So the differential equation, if it arises from the system, from the physics of the system, you know what type of motion you get. So again, the derivation was for a string, but let's think about what this is in general. The term here is going to be velocity squared. Now you're not going to explicitly get this, and remember that this is going to be the velocity of the wave. So this is your wave speed. And this is going to be in terms of other things. So in the case of the string, this term was t over mu, because for uh, a wave on a string, the wave speed is given by the square root of tension over the mass per length. So if you get an equation that looks like this, where this is just some sort of constant, you can exactly see what your wave speed is going to be. And the details of what type of system you're talking about is going to define this. So again, for a wave on a string versus an electromagnetic wave, we're going to see a very different phenomena.
So any system that is going to be described this way, again, if we just think about Newton's laws or in the case of electromagnetic waves, Maxwell's laws, you are going to get traveling waves. Now, you might also get standing waves, but right now what, what we're saying is, you know, you'll actually get sinusoidal traveling waves. So not just any, but sinusoidal. So this is really exciting, and we're going to return to this when we talk about electromagnetic waves. So anytime you have an equation like this, the solutions will have this form, which is what we've already talked about. And again, the wave speed, which you can read from whatever the constants are in the problem, is going to allow you to relate our wave number and our angular frequency. So again, it's, it's helpful to be able to recognize when you have a differential equation of this form that one, your solutions look like this, and two, that means you actually get traveling sinusoidal waves. So we're going to use this fact later for electromagnetic waves.